church is a unique situation in that sense where you have folk from all ages, backgrounds, nations uh, coming together on a Sunday morning. My observation is, and I can only speak for the church that I serve as pastor, but is that we've got a long way to go yet. So there's us, and partly because, and you guys will be the same at QP, if you've got people traveling from quite far distances, you know, we have people that travel up to half an hour to get to Falkirk Baptist from across the, the Fourth Valley. And um, a lot of the time it's about them. They get to catch up with the people they have relationships with in the church, you know. It's the only time of the week they've seen them. And so, you know, I just observe what goes on and I just notice the families all get together. I notice the, you know, the 20-somethings migrate together. The older people sit together. Um, the singles, who are singles, you know, they're often left to sit, you know, on their own. And so I think to get people comfortable uh, in relationship with people that are different to them will help them then connect with non-Christians outside. Greetings and welcome to this week's Calling a City to Life, a podcast by Queen's Park Baptist Church in windy Glasgow, Brody, sunny Glasgow. Uh, well, you're more sensitive to the wind just now, given that you're trying to kind of like do a stupid method of putting a roof on. <laughs> yes, yes. At the moment, all I can see out my window is a crane operator who's decided not to operate his crane because I can also see the kind of bit of string that's tied to a drain pipe that's blowing uh, horizontally currently. So yes, uh, crane operations are off for the day. Uh, so yeah, it's certainly in Ayrshire, it's windy and a bit dreek. But we're joined by a man who's... Weather is almost certainly more glorious than it is where I am in Ayrshire. Is that right, uh, Al? Is Falkirk always a home of the sunshine? I'm not sure that's true because it may be an urban myth, but they say that if it's raining in Glasgow, Larbert and Falkirk will be raining as well. And if it's raining in Edinburgh, Larbert and Falkirk will be raining as well. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so yeah. Anyway, all, all I can say is I used to live in St Andrews. And I can absolutely vouch it's a lot wetter in Larbert and Falkirk than it is in St Andrews, I can assure you that. Yeah, it's all the righteous people in St Andrews doing their saintly things. That's, <laughs> that's what calls it. Uh, right, well, we had yourself, uh, Al, speaking last Sunday at Queen's Park. But before we get you to do a quick introduction, you are the minister at Falkirk Baptist Church. So why don't you give us the give us the spiel of what's happening in Falkirk? Well, uh, yeah, I'm the minister. I'm, I'm one of the ministers. There's two of us now, um, which is great. Uh, it's actually the first, I think, the first ever time in its 200 plus history that we've had uh, more than one pastor. Uh, so that's exciting times. And um, my colleague Adam is just doing a great job. We've actually just changed his title. He was assistant pastor with responsibility of visual community and youth. He's now moved to being our Minister of Mission and Evangelism, and he's doing a bit more on the mission side of things and evangelism. So so things are going really well at Falkirk. We have, um, yeah, we've just um, we've seen a spate of uh, conversions in, in recent times, which has been amazing, and a bunch of, we've had a lot of baptisms this year as well. So things are things are going well. And um, Cool. So this weekend's talk was about evangelism. Did, did we invite? Brody, did Ian invite the wrong person? Did he invite the wrong person? <laughs> yes, exactly. I did think that when I got there. <laughs> <laughs> Should we invite the guy with the word evangelism in his title? Exactly. exactly. Well, I, in fairness exactly. to Ian, I don't think that Al's colleague had that word in his title when Ian <laughs> did the invitation. So I'll, I'll stick up for Ian. Ian, I'm sticking up for you. <laughs> Good to know. It's the first time for everything I saw with Brody. Well, I'm not, yes, I, indeed. To be honest, I'm not even sure Ian knows I have a colleague, if I'm being brutally honest. Um, we tend to only uh, meet in WTC land, and that doesn't that conversation uh, hasn't happened, I don't think. Now, I did notice, uh, from because I, I like to go into the church website bios of people, and I did notice uh, that your bio uh, has some personal uh, commentary about things you're interested <laughs> in, so... Are you more into Metallica or Black Sabbath, or are you more a, you know, System Down well, Dream Theater? I, I hear yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm definitely a Dream Theater guy. I have right, all okay. their albums, and I'm gutted that they are 
only playing one date now that the original drummer Mike Portnoy has come back into the band, uh, which was huge news. And uh, but they're only playing one gig in London. The problem with Dream Theater is they only play seated venues, and I haven't seen them now since oh five years ago or so. Because the last couple of times they've been at the uh, concert hall in Glasgow um, or at the SECC, the only affordable te- uh, um, uh, tickets, you know, seats are up in the what do they call them? The gods. Uh, what's that term? Gods. The, <laughs> ah, yeah, that kind of thing, you know. Um, otherwise, you're paying hundreds of pounds uh-huh. whereas for example Tremonti who's a the guitarist of Creed and Alter Bridge yeah. uh, he'll be coming uh, to Glasgow in, in, in February I'll be there because it's all you just buy a ticket and then you just push yourself to the front of the stage that's what I do and I haven't have a dr- I haven't have a drum in the church that's uh, a signed drum signature drum not actually signed by the by the former current member of uh, dream theater so there you go the, the guy that took the former current who do you well mean? the 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 guy who took over when the guy left and now the guy's back he's now the yeah former. yeah so mike mangini you're talking about mike, mike mangini, mangini. Yeah. yeah yeah both drummers so have had the name mike and yes. uh, both both drummers are insanely good my goodness yes they're very good very good so yeah, there okay. we go I can, so i can feel jackie saying wife. we need to yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> this is the fight my wife would drop richard in stop going, disappearing oh, down rabbit holes <laughs> i was hoping you were going to ask me i was hoping you were going to ask me about triathlons or or motorbike riding i could have well, we can do that at the end of the show no bother, you know we can do that at the end of the show good well you spoke on ephesians chapter two this past week so why don't you give us a wee 60 second summary of of what you discussed or what you told us about well, it was really just, uh, I was using the Ephesians, I mean, it wasn't an exegesis of the, uh, sorry, an, an in-depth look at the Ephesians passage. It was really just to, yeah, just to capture the 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 reality on the ground, so to speak, of, uh, of most human beings, uh, all human beings, which is that, you know, we are, we are just by being human, we are separated from God and our sin has you know breached a chasm between us and god and in and through jesus christ we can have that chasm bridged and uh, so there really is a, a an urgent say and a you know a clarion call to christians to become more intentional and uh, intentional and so that's what we looked at in terms of you know um really the intentionality you know the, the heart behind mission has to be there first before you look at your models or your approaches and it, and it definitely seems to me we do a lot of writing on approaches and types of different ministries without necessarily really ad- addressing what I think is quite a challenging situation in the West, which is that we've, uh, yeah, evangelicalism is now very broad and you have a right gamut of beliefs about where people go after they die within, uh, broadly speaking, evangelicalism. So hmm. Now, one of the first things you identified was the... The idea that how many of us actually have a lot, you know, how wide is our non-Christian circle? And regrettably, it's decreasing, not because they're all becoming Christians, but because we seem to just have less contacts, at particularly a challenge for people like yourself and Brody who are in full-time ministry. What do you think has changed within culture, society, personal relationships that's led to that decrease? Or is it just something that a limited portion of Christianity experiences because we're so siloed nowadays in some way, shape or form. Yeah, I definitely think there's a, a Western phenomenon in that in that regard, for sure. For sure we are. I'm just back from India. I'm just back from Cambodia. And um they still are very, very community minded. And um, you know, the when I was in India we were doing seminars for uh, pastors and church planters um, um, in a couple of networks that, that Falkirk Baptist Church has connection with. And, um, you know, these are people who travel three, three, four hours um, to get to the seminar, you know, just for, uh, for a, a, you know, a three hour seminar or a day together. But these people all live in their villages. They're all mixing. We went to visit um, a number of villages and it was so fascinating because quite a few of them had the same story, which was there's one soul family christian family in this in this village a village of about 150 people and this was repeated three times in three villages i went to and um but they're the only christian family and all of them had the same testimony which was the family were getting ahead in terms of their own their own life and um so the local witch doctor uh notices that places a curse on the family 
And uh, in each of the families, one of the daughters basically becomes uh, demonized, we would call it, in terms of using New Testament uh, speech. And um, in all three of these cases, missionaries and church planters from a mission that had some sort of, they got wind of this, they had connection, they went in and they performed a deliverance ministry. And the girls were delivered of these evil spirits and the family basically in turn become a whole Christian family. But that's just the start really for them because they're now the only Christian family in the village. They're mixing with their Hindu neighbors. And so there's definitely that connection. So I think when you're talking about, you know, the silos that we have, you know, how many of us, I mean, I live in a street here in Larba and I honestly hardly know anybody. And I've been here seven years. Like you really don't know my my physical neighbors at all. There's n- nobody, um, you know, um, even, even the, you know, the idea of, in fact, I was reading a book on this quite recently. They were just saying simple architecture, like all of us now are having conservatories built on the back of our houses because, and that encourages to say, whereas in the olden days, actually they were talking about the South of America where you had the, you know, the open porch. And so people would sit on the open porch and, and then there's a whole, been a whole architectural change to, to build on the back of the house into the garden. And that just removes you from facing out on, you know, just simple things that we don't even think about um, that have happened. And as, as we all now kind of go, you know, and I think since COVID, you know, you, we're now, I don't know about you guys at QP, but in Falkirk, so many of our guys are now hybrid working. So they really are, the, the whole mixing with their non-Christian, uh, their non-Christian colleagues has, has, has dramatically reduced because they're only going in one or two days. And now that Scott Rail put their prices up, that'll probably go down <laughs> even more. So, you know, there's just these factors, isn't there? And then, and then your social groups. You know, Christians often tend to, and it was helpful because it was, I mean, Brody mentioned at the end, you know, proximity, the whole concept. And I, I, and I just think, actually, I feel it as a pastor acutely, but actually it might be quite similar for the vast majority of folk in, in the church. Richard, a, there's a really interesting report called the Talk Jesus Report. If people Google Talk Jesus Report, I'm sure you'll find it. It's not hugely long. Um, and there's 10 years between the first time they did this and then they did it 2023, 20, 20, I can't remember exactly. 10 years ago, the average Christian or the Christians on average in the UK had five non-Christian friends. And now this report is saying that we have two. Really encouragingly, it says that people are up for talking about Jesus. So the, the, there's a more open context or the context in which we can talk about Jesus isn't ta- sometimes as scary as what we think it is. I think one of the big differences perhaps between our context or some of our context, because we're not quite we're not quite post-Christian. We're a strange mixture of old Christendom, cultural Christianity. Um, and whatnot. So a lot of our evangelism is actually pre-evangelism. It's clearing out the rubbish of misconceptions, mistruths, and misbeliefs. Um, uh, so back in the day, people used to talk about the Ingalls scale of kind of like people's journeys to uh, Jesus. And I think it started at minus 10 and went to plus 10 or something like that, because we're not just looking for decisions, we're making disciples. Um, and I think it was Des Johnson from uh, Alpha said, if, you know, 20 years ago in the West, people were starting at minus 10, now they're starting at minus 40. There's just a lot of, for many people, not for all, um, but for, 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 for many people. But there is that, that challenge of, um, it's hard to maintain the relationships that we've got. And very often there's that, the tension in church. We know that tension of be part of a small group, be active in a ministry, and people become busy with church life. Well, if they're really busy with church life, how do they maintain or make or find non-Christian friends? So we, we need both. It's not a case of ditch one for the other. But how do we have a, 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 a healthy relationship between a uh, between both and that's a challenge nobody's saying that that's easy but it starts with heart and it starts with intentionality hmm. do you think that it's a that what we're experiencing as christians and our relationships with people out with of our own defined group we define ourselves as christians 
do we think that's repeated elsewhere? Like, do we think that this is a cultural norm that other people are experiencing? That, you know, people that play football every Sunday are now have less friends that don't play football every Sunday. You know, are we just honing down our relationships? You know, social media and all that's allowing us to project a very thin image a great distance. Is this resulting in us also doing the opposite? We're having very few deeper relationships across the board, or is this something we're experiencing? I mean, I, I think I think hundred percent that we are we're no different in this sense to what's happening across society at the moment. It was fascinating. I was I was actually watching YouTube earlier. Well, actually, in the earlier hours of this morning, I was awake, <laughs> and um, I was watching. There's a bass guitar player, right? So he's 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 massive on YouTube, um, an amazing player, and he was being interviewed by Rick Beato, who's a kind of uh, famous producer. Uh, yep, and so exactly uh, and the just, channel you mean? <laughs> yeah, he was. So this guy's called Charles Bertude. He's an English uh, bass player, and he's yeah. And the title was the guy changing bass play, you know, kind of thing, because he's quite amazing. But his comment was this. He said, it was about how did you get into the YouTube world? So he just does YouTube, this guy. And he said, I was playing at different clubs and gigs and stuff, doing my my stuff and my my soloing on my bass and stuff. And basically it was, it was tumbleweed. There was no interest whatsoever. And then he said, but then I started doing a YouTube thing. I mean, this is like a decade ago. And all of a sudden, he started to find people who were interested, for whom that's what they wanted to see. And, you know, he's now up to like 2 million or whatever. And, uh, I mean, there was a comedian, an Australian comedian. I won't, I will not repeat what he said because it was absolutely, it was, it was crass and it was rude. But he basically said, you know, whatever, you know, he was maybe exaggerating, but he basically said, whatever kind of fetish that you have, you can now find you know, even if it's a fetish, it's illegal or something that's abhorrent to your average person physically around you, you can now find a community that want to do that fetish online. I remember thinking, you know, there's there's truth to that because, um, you know, there's certain communities who have committed crimes who are not allowed to go online because, they, they you know, the assumption is they'll, they'll, they'll meet like-minded people. And so I think all that, you know, in terms of, you know, just finding people who are just like-minded, creating these echo chambers, I just don't think Christians are immune to that as well. So I guess this kind of leads us down the path of, do we have any solutions to any of this uh, in terms of going forward? You're both uh, responsible for large church communities. Uh, what do you both see as being what should be encouraged in congregations and yourselves to actually you know, push into resolving any of this? I love uh, Mark Scandrett's idea of church as a dojo. So uh, I was uh, I was being dad taxi last Saturday, taking uh, Robert to uh, Dale Rugby Club, and on the way past by a building which actually looked as though it was a former church that was now a dojo. So a dojo is where people would practice martial arts, and Mark. I'm going to use his first name because his surname is difficult to pronounce. This isn't suggesting that we fight each other, but that church is somewhere we practice who Jesus has called us to be in the world. So if loneliness and isolation and how do we share our testimony, how do we share what God is doing in our lives is something that is challenging, then we practice it with each other. And I'm not thinking of just a Sunday morning. Of course, church is not just a Sunday. But in our small groups, when we meet friends for coffee, of are we, as we did as we started this, talking about the weather, or are we helping each other kind of like share what God is doing in our lives? What's God saying to you this weather? What's God doing? You know, what's what, what are you excited about? Um so that we, we learn and we, we get comfortable in kind of like speaking that way so that almost in one sense without thinking when we're with work colleagues, again, I, I love the idea of, of front line. So when we're on our front line, when we're with those who don't know Jesus yet, often somebody says, what's new with you or how's your weekend? We just in a quite natural way without loads of jargon just share Jesus. Because we've practiced it in the dojo. Al, you building a dojo at home? 
I had no idea what he was talking about there at first. I was thinking it was a dodo he was referring to, and he just uh, <laughs> mixed up his letters. Um, yeah, I think it's a huge challenge. I mean, for me, it's it's about starting it personally. I can't I can't encourage people to do something that I'm not um, at, attempting myself, which is why it's been very good for for me, just just on a personal level, to have a colleague who uh, is constantly. Uh, challenging you know in terms of his his ability and uh and doing the acorn stuff that we just recently did with this dutch chap that we we're talking uh, i mentioned on saturday uh, sunday so um yeah it, i i i struggle with this in a sense because for 10 years i was in youth for the mission so i traveled a lot um in those 10 years that was when uh, before we had four children and my wife said, right, this traveling malarkey needs to stop. I need help at home. So that's when I moved into the past. That. But, um, you know, the the reality is persecution really drives, you know, and, and, we, and we don't want to be, we don't want to, you know, be idealistic about this. This is, it's not, you know, in any way, shape or form trying to idealize persecution in any way, shape or form. But it definitely, it seems to, uh, you know, galvanize community amongst people and really reinforce, you know, what they believe. And so, you know, the folk that I've learned the most from in terms of having faith in God and, you know, pursuing God have generally been in the African subcontinent and in Asia. Um, and, you know, so that I think, you know, Alan Hirsch says, um, uh, the missiologist, he says, you know, um, capitalism is what is discipling the church in the West. And it's doing a very, very good job at it. So we, I mean, we've talked about this a number of times at uh, Falkirk about, you know, what do we do with people who, who just, um, you know, who basically say, well, I've, I've fallen out of my previous church. I'm coming, I'm coming along to you guys. And so it, it's that whole consumerist uh, outlook, um, which it then, you know, then permeates everything. You know, I'll pick the friends that I like. I'll, I'll, I'll hang out with those who are, like me and that kind of thing and i just think that all of that negates potential for mission doesn't it and um and so it's really about you know what do you do with the, how can you how can you swim against the capitalistic tide as a as a as a church community um when we have so many ways and options of you know avoiding people we don't like or not hanging out with people we don't naturally connect to and uh, just creating these silos of of, of like minded folks, and I do it's it's a it's a it's a big big challenge. Uh, but for me, it has to start with me. That's that's really the bottom line. And it does make it tougher because, you know, society is so used to doing that to, you know, honing down into its lowest common denominator. But then when you're exposed to all types of people, all types of backgrounds, all types of personalities in church just makes it even harder because you get even less of experience as you say people are now working a lot of people are working from home so they're not rubbing shoulders you know getting off the sharp edges with their work colleagues having the you know the the to and froing of office life or factory life instead they're in their own wee silo in the house doing what we are doing now which is speaking over zoom uh it just makes it even more difficult when you go into a church with two three hundred people or however many dozens or a house group or whatever with folk that you wouldn't naturally choose but the geography has more likely brought you into that community and, the other. and you're like I, i'm not used to this i'm not used to hanging about with people that i don't 100 percent agree with or, or or whatever it might be it does make it odd so what what structures what uh attitude changes what talks from the pulpit if you like do we need to be exposing ourselves to to make this make this easier to make it just simpler to navigate i mean your comment about it being harder in chat i mean that, that's a i hadn't really thought about it but it, it kind of has to start with our the way that we interact with church doesn't it because actually it can be the training ground for mixing with people that are very different to you and um, because church is a unique situation in that sense where you have folk from all ages, backgrounds, nations uh, coming together on a Sunday morning. My observation is, and I can only speak for the church that I serve as pastor, but is that we've got a long way to go yet. So there's us, and partly because, and you guys will be the same at QP, if you've got people traveling from quite far 
distances. You know, we have people that travel up to half an hour to get to Falkirk Baptist from across the, the Fourth Valley. And um, a lot of the time it's about them. They get to catch up with the people they have relationships with in the church, you know. It's the only time of the week they've seen them. And so, you know, I just observe what goes on and I just notice the families all get together. I notice the, you know, the 20-somethings migrate together. The older people sit together. Um, the singles, who are singles, you know, they're often left to sit, on, you know, on their own. And so, you know, that that's that I think that has to be addressed first because obviously you're we're not gonna well, there's no way they're gonna they're gonna unless we decide to say you know and I, I know some churches have done this you know families you reach other families right so you get in you, you stick with your commonalities just accept them um, and work with them you know if you're older couples be missional at the local bowling club or, or whatever it is that you happen to be doing in, in retirement I mean we could do it that way and not be expecting sort of intergenerational and intersocial um, interaction and stuff but uh for me, that doesn't quite, you know, it doesn't lead to, you know, it doesn't reflect the kingdom as as, as, as I understand it. And so I think to get people comfortable uh, in relationship with people that are different to them will help them then connect with non-Christians outside. Rudy? Yeah, I mean, I think we're very similar, aren't we, at QP, of the whole challenge of the intergenerational thing and the importance of that, of... You know, we see in the New Testament that the basic building block of the church and of society is not the family, as is often said, but is the household. And the household would be bigger than your biological family. I mean, it was Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, who coined the phrase, birds of a feather flock together. So we're not dealing with a new issue. We're dealing with a, well, that's, that's in some respects, this is what, you know, half the pastoral letters of Paul are dealing with, of people who in Christ are brothers and sisters, but are not living out of that identity and are sticking with the people who are like them. So it's always been this way in one sense. I think in our culture, it's amplified because we live in a culture that, um, is fragrant, fragmenting more and more and siloing uh, uh, more and more. And just like, you know, I was talking of, you know, evangelism, it, it starts with me deciding of, do you know what, I'm going to go and speak to somebody who is not like me. As a pastor, that's slightly easier, you know, can like, you know, introduce yourself and, and, and whatnot. For other people, that might be a bit more of a challenge but there is that challenge and I love a uh, in the basement when sometimes you will see people who don't know each other talk to each other um, uh, and I think sermons don't fix this um, it's a uh, it's a uh, having spaces where people can can do this uh, so again in, in our life groups some life groups are people fairly similar to each other other life groups are radically a, a different people who, who are different. Some of the best spaces where we are thrown together with people who are not like us are in service teams or in ministry teams. Um, although can like, yeah, there's there's some that can like maybe in one sense self-select a bit of, so if you're in the worship team, there's a commonality of you play an instrument, you understand music to, to some lesser or greater degree, but there are potential opportunities but again, it's something that we need to be potential, uh, not potential, um, uh, conscious about uh, about this. And for me, one of the starting points is is brothers and sisters. You know, we are brothers and sisters in 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 Christ, and that's that's the baseline. Um, and just like a natural family, there are some, you know, siblings that you're closer to than others. But at the bottom line of of we have that in common. We have we have Christ in common, um, and looking out for each other in in that way. And from time to time, I hear beautiful stories of, uh, of that happening. Um, but there's 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 challenges challenges because of our geographical spread, challenges because of our busyness, challenges because, well, modern house builders build houses that are smaller, so having other people in your space is more of a challenge for many people. So there are lots of challenges uh, around it, but um, it's how do we 
I, led by the Spirit, are, are creative uh, in in uh, addressing those challenges. Hmm. Yeah, I, it's interesting. You both have made points about architecture uh, during uh, this discussion, and uh, even things like house building since COVID, whereby house builders are now instead of the the little home office ending up being a decision between the smallest bedroom becomes somebody's office. They're not actually building spaces for that, encouraging people even more to stay at home, to stay within their own four walls rather than rather than getting out and about. Uh, I never really thought about the significance of architecture and evangelism, but there's maybe a book there somewhere for a budding, <laughs> uh, a budding collaboration. It's not just our internal architecture of our homes as well. Wes White, who sadly passed away quite recently, and when he taught at the college, used to do um, like a walking tour of Glasgow where an architect would accompany him, um, quite a well-known architect. And he would help people kind of like exegete, look and read the urban architecture of where are the barriers that exclude people meeting together and connecting with each other and divert people down one way instead of another? Why do people walk in that side of the street and not the other side of the street? And it very often separates us. So there are, you know, in how our, our uh, cities are designed and therefore, you know, there is for our Christian architects of how do Christian architects bring something in the kingdom and how they design our social and private spaces um, but we're getting way off topic on that. <laughs> well, oh, pull us back, pull us back. Let's hand break, turn, so to speak, into something, Al, that you mentioned. And I'll ask this question. How important is the final destination towards the goal of being good, better, improving evangelists? You touched on the topic of hell during the sermon. How important is the understanding of a final destination to actually the motivation to evangelize in the first place? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was back and forth. Should I? <laughs> I, I? I'm coming to the church for the first time. Do I really <laughs> want to talk about the H word um, in the sermon? I, you know, what I'm observing in with certainly within the scholarship world is, um, you know, that tension that there is, there's a kind of push and pull going on between the Christian life just being about escaping hell and the Christian life being about making a difference here, you know, so you get kind of Tom Wright on one side really talking about the presence and what it means to be, you know, in the people of God, under the faithfulness of God, etc. And then you get a, you got your more kind of fundamentalist types who would probably argue, well, you know, the main thing is, is it, is it you're, you're going to go to heaven when you die. And, um, but it's both, isn't it? I mean, I, I just, you, you just can't jettison the other one, you know, the, the final destination simply because we're uncomfortable with it. Or, um, you know, I liken it to, you know, you can stand in front of a road and a car heading towards you 100 miles an hour and you can tell yourself, it's not going to hit me, it's going not going to hit me, it's not going to hit me, all you like. Um, but the truth is, it probably will hit you if they don't see you until the last minute. So, you know, I think there is... You know, death is a certainty, isn't it? Certainty, death, and taxes—the two certainties of life. And and um, and so, you know, I'm just, I'm amazed how little uh, thinking or talking about death that we actually do. Um, my children are absolutely abhorred because my I've asked for my song at my funeral to be uh, "Lay Me Down" by a band called Demon Hunter, and it's all about putting the coffin into the ground, and it's all about. Uh, God being present in you know the mourners and stuff like that and when I heard that song I thought you know this is really you know resonating with me in, in that sense because so I do think I think I think it has to be talked about and and we're unco I think that's I probably didn't articulate it well enough we're we're quite uncomfortable about talking about it and um and so I think that makes us, or that's one of the factors involved in us kind of operating like what I call functional universalists. We don't really want to talk about it. We we hope that we hope that God will just you know save everybody. Now there are theologians out there who are arguing strongly for that. Uh, a most a very a very uh, good case for that has been raised by uh, Orthodox theologian David Bentley Hart recently. Um, and so there are people out there writing on universalism. The challenge with universalism, I think it just strikes against our 
innate sense of ju justice. You know, um, when we hear of a somebody getting their hand cut off in Saudi Arabia because they stole a loaf of bread, we just innately know, do we not, that that seems very, excuse the pun, heavy-handed. You know, uh, that that's that's disproportionate to the crime, and yet at the same time, you know. Whenever, if I say to someone, yeah, uh, Adolf Hitler's going to be basking in glory with the Lord, I will always get a negative response to that. Like, no way. There's just no way. You know, so we we have this intrinsic understanding that there has to be some sort of uh, justice for all the stuff that goes unpunished, really, in this life. And we know that there's lots of things that go unpunished. And um, and so it's just kind of working out that that position. And I was always uncomfortable uh, with the idea that everybody, I've I've never quite landed that to believe that you know the Idi Amin's and the Pol Pots and the Hitlers will get the same punishment as little Jeannie who lives down the road, who's been a lovely woman and an asset to society, but has just never believed in Jesus. So that's you know when I came across Edward Fudge's book, The Consuming Fire of God, which is one of the kind of key text for the what's called the conditional immortality um a case of um basically a sort of judgment a sort of punishment and then annihilation or or cease to exist uh, that's kind of where i've landed but um yeah so you know it, it's it's there but i do think evangelicalism at the moment we're, we're quite confused on the matter and um there's just different voices speaking into it, and I think it, I do think it's affecting our our, our, our mission. Whereas, as I, I think I said this, you know, when you travel, one of the things is, you know, the growth of the Pentecostal church, for example, in in Africa, is to do with the power of the Holy Spirit, the real belief in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? So they see amazing miracles, but also a very conservative um, interpretation of Scripture. So they do believe people are going to hell, and that seems to really um, you know, galvanize and, uh, um, you know, empower their, their mission. Brody, how often does it come up as a topic of conversation when Joe Bloggs congregant is bringing the things that concern them? Uh, and say for yourself, Al, and your own congregation and congregational experience elsewhere, how often is a discussion of hell or what happens after you're dead actually a conversation starter? It's not <laughs> in general. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I what what I would encourage people to do is please plan your funeral before you die. That is so helpful. Um, <laughs> doesn't matter what age you are. Come and have a chat with Ian and I. Have a funeral plan in place. Um, I, and that's maybe the time to kind of like have that conversation rather than than a, a than later. Um, I'm less convinced than Al that our challenge in evangelism is because we don't believe in hell enough. It may be a factor. It may be a reasonable size factor, but I think there's lots of other factors in there as well. I think past disappointments in evangelism um, is a significant hurdle for many people to you know, we haven't changed friends. We've invited the person to Alpha 50 times. We've invited them to this. We've done, we've shared the gospel with them. We've prayed for them and still nothing has happened. Um, it's a significant factor for a significant number of, of people. Um, so I, I, that's most definitely a, in play. Um, is our passion and our desperation driving us on our knees enough of you know i'm always struck by you know paul saying i didn't come with an eloquence of speech but a demonstration of the power of the the spirit and oh boy is that what we need so i that's what i need don't know about anybody else um and what a difference that would that would make so i i think you know 100 percent with all of, do you know what, in one sense, the techniques and the models that we use are secondary. Whether we go for Alpha or Exploring Christianity or Acorn or, or um, Second Tables or all the different names that people give things, for sure there's wisdom in that and the Spirit has led and guided people into to various insights. But we need a move of the Spirit 
um, and we know through church history um, that that happens when we pray and when we are faithful to what God is uh, calling us to do. Um, so that increase of, of, of passion in, in prayer um, and and a faithfulness in what God is, is doing and taking those risks of I know I've spoken to this person a hundred times but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go again um, and that can be hard to do because of past pushbacks and and, and, uh, and rebuttals again I go back to the Talk Jesus report I was so encouraged of you know the research that is showing people are really up for talking about Jesus and talking about how Jesus can make a difference in their lives so rather than going through, as Al did on Sunday, you gave us uh, three, four examples of programs, for want of a better expression, of helping us to improve. I maybe want to see if we can pull out of all of the programs that we can think of some core principles that may help anybody listening, whether they go to QP or, or anywhere else for that matter, to hook on to some sort of way of just because i guess a lot of it i think comes down to bravery like what is the what is the smallest step we can make the easiest step that we can make to make things just a little bit easier or more successful in terms of how we we outreach to others so gentlemen from all your experience with this course is there any key principle you'd want to put forward as saying yeah going to focus on something focus on this first yeah i mean I, I just just to back up just a tiny bit i'm just interested i think Brody and i probably got a book between this just brewing because uh you know <laughs> in, in this sense because you know Brody's research is is on ethics and uh, i've just finished you know my my research is on but tomorrow morning i'm speaking at a men's breakfast on my three trips to auschwitz uh, Rwanda and Cambodia to talk about genocides and um, so it, it's very much a you know I really do focus on uh, in terms of my, my research on a lot of to do with the afterlife and the demonic and that kind of thing so that probably shapes my response to like, these questions. Well, um, bonus episode podcast coming up soon. Yeah 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 so with uh, with regard to this last one though what I found really we haven't done an alpha course at Falkirk Baptist since I arrived seven years ago. We did one uh, in our missional community a number of years ago. And for a while, I was thinking about, you know, we really need to get going. But what's been refreshing for us is I think alpha is great. It's, you know, I don't want to speak ill of it. I think what it does, though, it kind of, um, if it becomes the approach, it's that that you need many, many weeks to lead people to it. And there's a lot of a lot of input. What I've seen with my colleague coming along, in fact, Sunday morning, I preached at QP, as you know. Sunday night, we had a baptismal service and we had six candidates baptized. And uh, my colleague preached and he just preached the he just preached the gospel message. And we had two more with two people put their arms up to give their lives to Jesus. And and from that moment, we've now partnered them up with uh, more experienced uh, believers in the church to be discipled. So I've I've just, you know, you said about bravery and boldness. What I'm finding is, and this was the last one, the last model I talked about, you know, because I do think there's, uh, Brody said about poor evangelism done in the past, but I do think there's a real antipathy uh, towards the kind of four spiritual laws, you know, the 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 the, the ones that we used to do. And um, what I'm seeing with this uh, heart cross cross and then question mark that Adam uses is it seems to just tap straight into, and it just gets right to the nub of the issue, which is, you know, do you need Jesus? Are you going to give your life to Jesus? So uh, for me, I would just say, I would encourage people maybe to buy a bunch of those wee, uh, those wee cards, but just, just to have confidence in the basic message. I mean, it really is a very basic message that, that, that Adam uses when he shares with people. And I've tried it a couple of times as well. So um, yeah, just, just a boldness in, in, the, in the gospel and your story. Like I, I've tried this many times. I remember a long time ago, somebody said, just tell your test, be able to tell your testimony in one minute, like really home it down. Cause there's one thing nobody can ever argue with. And that's your own personal experience of how God has changed your life. So, um, you know, uh, not getting caught up in all the apologetic questions, but just saying, this is what Jesus did for me. And have been able to say it succinctly in a minute, along with the, 
these uh, kind of new sport or spiritual law type uh, questions that I talked about at the end. Rodi, any key component that you feel would, would assist? Yeah, I was struck when I, I was talking about the ACORN model, which was, was new to me of um, the element of that in which people come together to share how things are going. And I think that's so important. Yes, you know, we are all called to be um, witnesses and that's, you know, you can't be a witness for me, Richard, though how we interact can be a witness. Um, but so there's, a, there's that personal aspect of it. But I think very often we've become siloed and um, disconnected in that. And one of the reasons that we become um, uh, discouraged is because we've got no backup, as it were. Um, so I like the idea of, of connecting in for prayer support, for encouragement, for sharing what's going well, for sharing where the challenges are, for even um, a, of maybe you feel that in your conversation with a friend you've got so far, well, take another friend along with you who can have like just a different voice. And I think that's part of, of of where the alpha is, is good is there's there's multiple voices you're not there on your your own um so it's that how do we not become isolated um but having that confidence i think as well just again it, it sounds so simple but i know personally it's just been hard to be really disciplined uh, in doing this of so, you know on your way to work or you know the shops or the football or whatever of just saying Jesus, who is it you want me to speak to today? Would you just give me ears to hear you, your prompt and eyes to see? Um, I've done that a couple of times when I've been in hospital visits because I've just sensed I'm here to visit more than the person that I have planned to visit and had, you know, a, had conversations with other people. Um, I, so I think, you know, but it's it's... In the busyness of kind of like getting organised to get out of the house in the morning, often we forget to do those uh, uh, those simple things. But I think that being connected with with each other um, is uh, is important because it helps sustain us. Great stuff. Well, our show is drawing to an end, so I've just I've we'll... just texted you both the acorn details. Okay, so I have hundreds of. I was actually going to bring some of these on Sunday and I forgot. Oh, okay. So I've got tons. So <laughs> Paul's details on the back and I'm sure he'd be up for a conversation. And by the way, he does that every week but through Zoom. So people come together through Zoom. Adam and I did this for a season and we chat with other people about our conversations. And he's very good at drawing out, you know, what, what the Lord is doing and stuff. Yeah, I mean, he just does that as a, a you know, and then he, then he, he kind of um, hopes you'll go off and do that yourself. The report thing has been wider spread than just yes, an oh yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, sorry, I didn't, I didn't pick that up. That it was a, I assumed it was like running an alpha course. You do the acorn thing, and we all gather together, and this is what we do, and we report back. But it's actually wider. Yeah, we'll try and put that in the show notes, and uh, there's a YouTube channel, a Facebook page, etc. So go check out the show notes uh, for that, and uh, maybe drop in. Uh, I assume it's a YouTube live or zoom of some description that you can uh, join into i as we bring our session to a close we'll do f one final word prodi a final comment from yourself are you up for writing this book with al i don't know if i've got time um <laughs> i think it's back to that you know having confidence in the good news of jesus we have we have good news and um, the spirit is at work and having confidence uh, in uh, in that so let's keep uh, talking let's keep sharing um, and let's keep seeking god about this great stuff and alistair you preach it so you get the final word <laughs> yeah i mean i just think we just never as brody has said never underestimate what the lord is actually doing and uh, and it's that whole isn't it joining in with the mission of god it's the it's knowing that god is everywhere and he is working everywhere. And um, for us just to ask, right, Lord, just direct me to a person or a situation where I can I can 
have have some input, you know. Um, well, I'll finish it if I do. If you don't mind, I'll finish. With a very short, there's a very uh, quite a well known story, and it's absolutely true. But of an Australian evangelist who used to just um, sorry, this is getting off topic a bit, but, but you know, you just <laughs> never know. You never know what the Lord's doing. So basically, this Australian evangelist, I think he was in Sydney somewhere like that, and all he would do is he'd walk up to random strangers and go, "Do you ever think about where you're going to go when you die?" And that's it. He would leave. So this is back to our question about is the final destination important. But he never, ever heard about, you know, um, anybody coming to faith. And he's on his deathbed. He's dying of cancer. And somebody somewhere in the world shared that they had come to faith through him asking that question. And then that just led the journey. And then the guy was doing it online. He was on a podcast or something like that. And then all these other people started feel, you know, uh, feeding in saying, oh, I, I, I met that guy and I'm now a Christian. Anyway, it turned yeah. out there was a whole host of people. And eventually one guy who knew him, you know, went, went to see him and basically told him on his deathbed that there's numerous people become Christians. And the guy was just overcome with emotion because he didn't know. He'd never known whether he'd, he just obeyed God without ever seeing fruit. And uh, he, so he, we just don't know. And we'll find out when we get to glory. Just what our lives have, uh, what chain reactions we've been a part of, or even started, perhaps. Yeah, for all that we see, street preachers and and the likes, and sometimes we're like, oh, I don't fancy that much. If you ever actually speak to them, some of the stories they've got of random encounters with folk and bringing folks faith are just phenomenal. But we will leave it at that. I, Alice, are you preaching in Falkirk Baptist this weekend? We've actually got a church conference this weekend, oh, and our whole conference theme is on going from being uh, a, church, a, a church with a church-based mission to being a mission-based church. So that's uh, uh, Norman Graham, who used to be the pastor at Denny Baptist. He's now part of ours, and Norman's been a kind of guy who's spoken on mission and missional thinking for many years, so he's kicking us off, and Adam's doing some stuff about evangelism, and then I'm bringing it in with the vision. So yeah, We're we've got a conference. Hell. No, 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 yeah, no. We'll yeah. not be talking about hell. No, no, no. no, no. I just Turner saved that burn for message at the end. I, I just saved that for QP. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. Thank you for that. I'm sure. Work. I'm sure that that you guys the was... you're robust. You're robust. Exactly. The, the car was probably draining from Brody as you started the conversation. <laughs> I'm not going to get questions about this. Yeah, but that's great. Just you come in, throw the hand grenade, and leave. That's just fine. Brody, who's preaching this weekend? It's myself. Excellent. And what do we have? Are you, are you are you willing to review your hands? If people read the blog, they will know what is coming. Oh. Read the blog and you will know. There we go. There's wise words for us all. And on that note, we'll say goodbye. Thank you very much for listening. You can get in touch with the show via the office or office at qpbc.org. If you have any questions, comments, or anything you'd like to cover, uh, thanks for listening. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.